Let's make this confession together. I thank you, Father, that your word has the power to change my life. Today I give heed to it. I allow it to go into my ears, then into my mind, and then into my spirit. I'm a hearer of the word and a doer of the word. And I'll never be the same after today. In Jesus' name, everybody shouted amen. amen. Everybody gave their next door neighbor a Bible high five. Amen. You may be seated. The announcement right off the bat, right here as we begin this message, is that this message is unashamedly and unapologetically about money. Amen. We are going to talk about money this morning. We're going to talk about giving. And uh, Luke chapter 6 verse 38 that I heard had you turn to says, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And, uh, I, you know, I need to clarify something here in the actual Greek language. The word bosom here does not mean what's in your mind. <laughs> I probably need to fix that. Um, but actually in the Greek, what this is talking about, and the Amplified Bible actually says this. It's talking about having a, a robe. When a man had a robe and whenever he uh, would go to the market or he would go somewhere and he wanted to take something with him, he would pick up that robe and he would form a, 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 like a basket or something with his robe and they could put stuff in there. And he, and he could care, actually carry it like that. So here it says that if you give, it'll be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into the fold of your robe. I think another translation says it that way. Um, and it, uh, it says uh, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. In other words, you're trying to get home. Imagine you're trying to get home, holding all this stuff up in your robe and it's falling out everywhere because you have abundance. Because you have more than, more than you can carry. That's the picture that I want you to have when you read this verse. We're going to talk about money today. We're going to talk about money in church. And I, I'm, I, I want to thank you for being a church that lets me talk about money. Uh, you know, every pastor needs to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. But you know, there are some churches that, that, you know, when the pastor starts talking about money, people freak out and people get mad and people leave and they write nasty emails and all that stuff. Thank you for being a church that's open to receiving the word of God. Every church needs to talk about money. It's a shame that there are, and I'm not trying to condemn any other pastors or leaders or tell anybody else what they need to preach on. Pastors need to preach to their to their uh, people what the Holy Spirit shows them to preach. But some pastors are intimidated by their congregations, not realizing that they're holding their congregations back from being everything God called them to be and being able to do everything God called them to do. Um, why wouldn't we talk about money in the church when there are 218 scriptures on salvation? How many of you heard this before? There are 215 scriptures on faith and there are 2,084 scriptures on money. 16 of the 38 parables Jesus taught were about money. 67% of marriage conflicts are over money. 50% of divorces are over money. And Ecclesiastes 10, 19 says that money has answers. Money won't buy happiness. And money won't get you into heaven. Money won't, you can't buy your way into heaven. And you can't buy friends, or at least you don't want the friends you can buy. But Ecclesiastes 10.9 does say that money has answers. Money says to debt, I can free you. Money says to vision, I can release you. Money says to the poor, I can feed you. Money says to time, I can direct you. Money says to need, I have an answer for you. And I want you as a congregation, I want you as individual people and families to get a vision of what it's like to live a blessed life. I mean, as a congregation... Sure, we pray when, when different things happen, whenever there's a, uh, there's a tragedy or there's an issue that happens or somebody needs prayer. We all pray as a congregation. But rather than just praying for them, what would it be like if we could pray over the large offering that we received to send to them? I'm talking about having a hundred families in here that could very easily give a thousand dollars a piece to, to alleviate a need. Mm, 
I'm trying to get you to get a vision of what it's like to lead a blessed life that you spend, that you can spend a part of your time in the morning with God rather than praying and asking God to help you figure out how you're going to pay your bills and get through the week this week. But instead, we're asking God to reveal to us what to do with the extra abundance that we have and who to sow that to. Living a blessed life. Everybody wants to hear about a blessed life and everybody wants to live a blessed life. It's just that not many people want to talk about money in church. It's been almost four years. Those of you that are new, uh, I just want you to know, we don't, I don't do a message on money every, every Sunday. I know that's one of the accusations of churches is that's all they talk about mo- is money. And actually, I don't know any churches that's, a, that's all they talk about is money. Uh, it just maybe God's trying to speak to you if every time you go to a church, they talk about money. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. I apologize already. I'm, in, I'm already in trouble. Uh, but... It's been, it's been almost four years since I've done a Sunday morning uh, series on money. And so, but I think with 2,000 scriptures on money as opposed to 2,000, I mean, every Sunday we give an invitation for people to come to salvation. And there are only 218 scriptures in the Bible about it. Okay. Amen. So, uh, so we, don't, we don't preach about money all the time, but this morning I am. And we're, we're going to talk about it. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 1, uh, up on the screen here, really talks about why pastors need to talk about money in their churches. Jeremiah chapter 23 says, woe to the shepherds. And that word shepherds in the Hebrew it actually means pastors. It's talking about pastors here. Woe to the pastors who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the pastors who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back into their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And now... uh, He begins to describe what should have been done. He says, woe to you pastors because you scattered my sheep. Instead, you should have been doing this. And here's what they should have been doing. First of all, I will set up pastors over them who will feed them and they shall fear no more. In other words, pastors are responsible to alleviate fear in their congregations. Uh, Nor be dismayed. Dismay is confusion, discouragement, and brokenness. And that pastors are to alleviate confusion, uh, discouragement, and brokenness in their congregations. And then thirdly, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. In other words, pastors who are good pastors, who don't scatter the sheep, but are rather the pastors that God has set in place, are going to deal with the situation of lack in the body of Christ. Now, everybody wants pastors to deal with the situation of lack in their life. They just don't want them to talk about money. First service laughed at that. You're like, okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, oh, Pastor Steve, show me how I can, show me how I can deal with the situation of lack, but don't talk about money in church. I don't want to talk about money in the church, but do help me figure this out. And so I, I love you enough to tell you the truth, that can't happen. If we're going to talk about lack and we're going to deal with lack and we're going to alleviate lack, the thing we must do is talk about money and what the Bible says about money. So thank you for being a church that allows me to be open, honest, and straightforward about money. I mean, after all, how many of you are working 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours a week trying to make ends meet, and then you come to church and and we can't worship because we're trying to figure out how we're going to get everything together and how we're going to be able to take care of everything. There's a better way. And I want to talk to you about that today. I want to talk with us, talk with you about understanding giving. Eight things you need to understand about giving. You see, we need to understand giving. Luke 6.38 says, uh, let me read this to you out of the New Living Bible. Luke 6.38 says, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. See, there that is in the New Living Translation. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. New Living Bible, Luke 6.38. So if giving determines what our harvest is going to be or what we're going to get back, then we should talk about this in church. Everybody ready? 
Everybody, unco- everybody uncomfortable? Everybody comfortable? Everybody okay? Comfortable or uncomfortable? We're going in. Eight things we need to understand about giving. Number one, tithes and offerings are not the same. And that's why this morning I did the illustration that I did. What I did was we received the tithe. I didn't want any offerings in that, just the tithe. Because what we just did is for everyone that tithed, what you just did according to to, uh, Malachi chapter 3 verse 8. In fact, if we turn there, it says... um, that uh, Malachi 3 8, will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me? But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and, everybody say and. and. Tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. This, now, this does not say that if you don't tithe, God's going to curse you. It's not what that means. What that says is, there is already a curse on the earth. We talked about that when we talked about tithing. It's already there. And so the tithe removes the curse off of the other 90% so that God's blessing is on it. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me or prove me now in this, says the Lord, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing, there will not be room enough to receive it. So we, we see two things happening here. We see the windows of heaven open. We see heaven open. Everybody say heaven open. We see heaven open. And then we see blessings being poured out. And so tithes and offerings are not the same. What some of us do is we take an offering envelope and on the top line where it says tithe, we write $100 and put it in. Or we write $55 and put it in. And so what what a lot of us are not used to doing is asking ourselves, how much tithe and how much offering am I putting in? And it makes it, does that really make a difference? I mean, as long as the church gets it, does it really make a difference? It makes a difference to you and it makes a difference to God. It doesn't make any difference to me because, you know, you can put whatever you, whatever you put in the offering bucket, we're happy with. I mean, you can put a, you put a hundred dollars in there. And we go, oh, wow, praise God, a hundred dollars. And, but God knows what he's blessed you with. But for, for us, he knows what's tithe and what's offering. We don't. We'll take, we'll take anything. To quote John Avanzini, we'll take a ham sandwich. If it's wrapped up good, we'll eat it for lunch after the service. We'll take anything you put in there. So it's not an issue for us. The question is for you because this says that when you tithe, heaven opens over you. And then what you give in offerings determines what comes through that window. Not every scripture in the Bible is about tithing and not every scripture in the Bible is about offerings. Every scripture in the Bible about financial giving is one or the other. And the one, the scriptures that are about tithing deal with a set amount. You see, the tithe is the same for everybody. The tithe is the same for you as it is for you as it is for you as it is for you. It's not something that we decide. The tithe is the first 10% of our income that we give into the local church. That's the tithe. It's the same. It's, it, there's not a, you know, depending on how much you give, you're going you're gonna to be blessed back. That's not the tithe. The tithe is the same for everybody. But then when it comes to the blessing being poured out, that has to do with the offering part. Hence, Luke 6, 38 that we just read that says, give and it will be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over with the same measure that you give it will be given back to you again. You see, that's not talking about tithing because it's talking about you deciding which measure you're going to use. Which measure are you going to use when you give? That's right. For example, <laughs> if this is the measure that you use, when, now this is, we're not talking about tithing. Okay, the tithe is already done. We already tithed. Everybody got that? Heaven is open over this congregation right now. Got it? Everybody understand? Now, what we give in offerings determines what comes through that window. And if this is the measure that you use, then this is the measure that you get. This is the measure God uses. Luke 6, 38, we just read it. You don't sound too excited. If this is the measure you use, this is the measure God uses. Now, what's the wheelbarrow doing on the congregate, on the platform? If this is the measure that you use, Uh Uh-oh, somebody's getting a little more excited now. If this is the measure that you use, this is the measure that's going to be used back to you. 
Yeah, still not very excited. Okay, let's see what else we can do. So now, if this is the measure that you use, this is the measure that's going to be used back to you again. I did this in the first service, but I dumped dirt all over the... This is the measure that's going to be used back to you. Whatever measure you decide to use, this is not the tithe. The tithe has already been given. Heaven is open. And now the measure that you use determines what comes back to you through that window. So some of you got a little bit more excited when you saw the wheelbarrow. But you know what I want to hear when I sow my offering? I want to hear beep, 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 beep. 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 That's what I want to hear. It, and it's not up to God. God, when you, it's not up to God, it's up to us. Luke 6 38 says that when you give, it's given back to you according to the measure that you use. And so the first thing I want you to see about understanding giving is that tithes and offerings are not the same thing. And I think, I think a misunderstanding of this has robbed more people in the body of Christ of what God wants to do than anything else. We take, we take the envelope out and on the top line, we write $50. Church ought to be happy with that. Honey, you can write $1,000, $10,000, $100,000, $5, $2. We are grateful for every dime that comes in and every giver. But when you write $10,000 on that line and go, wow, the church ought to be really happy with this. That's not the issue. The issue is how much of that is tithe? The tithe belongs to God. You're not, when you tithe, you're not giving to God. When you tithe, you're not giving to God because it already, the tithe already belongs to him. That would be like me borrowing a rake from Bill Randall here, saying, hey, can I borrow a rake to, to rake my yard? So I rake my yard and I take it back and I give the rake that belongs to Bill back to Bill. And then I go all over the neighborhood and tell everybody in the neighborhood, hey, I just gave a rake to Bill and, uh, to Bill and Wendy. I didn't give them a rake. It was their rake. Hello, somebody. I had it. I gave it back to them. And so when we tithe, the Bible says, we've covered that the last two weeks, the tithe is holy and it belongs to God. And so when we tithe, we're going, wow, I tithe. God must be really happy. God's saying, no, it's about time you returned my rake. <laughs> we're not giving God anything. The tithe belongs to God and it removes the curse off the other 90%. Anybody with me today? So, so then... When, and, but God, you know, only God is so generous. Like God, I can't believe God wants 10% of my money. Honey, it's not our money for everything we got, we got from God. And when, when it, only God would, would give us a blessing. I mean, that would be like me returning the rake to, to uh, Bill and Wendy and them saying, well, here, here's $10. Well, I just returned your rake. Yeah, but I want to bless you. I mean, it's amazing that God would say, if you give me what's mine, I'm going to open heaven over you. He doesn't have to do that. And I said before, when I was teaching the tithing series, the tithe belongs to God. And if God never promised to open heaven over Connie and I, we would tithe anyway because the tithe belongs to him. It's his. So then the offering is a completely different thing. The offering, whatever measure we use when we give offerings is the measure that God is going to use with us. Number one, the first thing we need to understand about giving is that tithes and offerings are not the same. Number two, the Bible calls giving in the house of God sowing. Why not just call it giving? The Bible calls giving in the house of God sowing. Second Corinthians, go with me to Second Corinthians chapter 9. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. But this I say, 2 Corinthians 9, 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. This is not talking about sowing corn or wheat or anything. This is talking about financially. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Look down at verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. This is talking about sowing. In fact, there are 12 different scriptures and parables in the Bible that talk about giving as sowing. In Bible culture, here's the problem with Americans. In our, we have a completely different culture and a completely different mindset than, than 
uh, Bible people did. When Jesus talked about sowing and reaping and talked about sowing finances and reaping, they knew exactly what he was talking about because that whole culture was built on that. They, these people were farmers. They owned livestock. They, uh, they farmed wheat and produce. And so they knew the power that was in a seed. Most of us have never even held a seed in our hands. And we don't understand. We depend on the farmers. Thank God for farmers, everybody say. We depend on the farmers to do that for us. This was a whole culture of farmers. And so when they took that seed and when Jesus said, when you take that and you sow it, it's going to produce a harvest, they understood it. Us, we have a completely different mindset here. I'm going to come to work for you. You're going to pay me $50,000 a year. And I'm then going to, uh, to complete these four projects for you in the next 12 months. I complete the four projects. You give me the $50,000. And it's just an exchange uh, evenly for what I agreed to do. And that's the culture and that's the mindset. So we can't get this whole idea of taking after we tithe and heaven's open, then taking a sum of money and sowing it and it multiplies because we don't our culture doesn't operate that way their whole culture operated that way and when Jesus talked to them about the power of a seed they understood that when I put an apple seed in the ground I don't just get one apple I'm going to get a whole tree full of apples for years to come when I buy that cow I'm not just going to get one gallon of milk I'm going to get thousands of gallons of milk they understood the power of multiplication the power of a seed so when the Bible talks about giving, it doesn't just talk about, there's a big difference between giving and sowing. Point number three, not all giving is sowing. Not all giving is sowing. You can give something and it's not necessarily sowing. And I, Connie and I do that all the time. Sometimes there's somebody, we have given money to people, given money to families, given money in a situation, and it wasn't good ground to give in. We knew we weren't going to get a harvest back for that. We just wanted to help somebody. We've helped families that we knew they, they were in tough times because they, of some of the choices that they made. And maybe there's not even any evidence they're going to get out of it. They haven't changed their mind, but we just felt sorry for the kids or whatever. And so we gave some money to help. That's giving. We're not going to get anything back for that. The Bible says he who gives to the poor lends to the Lord, which means if I give them $10, God will be sure that he gives me the $10 back. And that's as far as it goes. And, and, and we do that. The Bible says that we should, out of our abundance and how God has blessed us, that we should bless those that, that need help. But that's not sowing. And you're not going to get a harvest from that. There's a big difference between giving and sowing. Let me get, we're still on number three. Not all giving is sowing. But there are three things I want you to understand about this. Number one, the difference between giving and sowing is the expectation of a harvest. Which, by the way, is not wrong. Amen. That's right. It's not wrong. Listen, it all belongs to God. And I, uh, you know, there are some, some people are, that are, it sounds so religious and it sounds so good to say, you know what, I just give and I give to God and I don't expect anything back. I don't expect God to do anything for me because, you know, I just, I just love God and I want to give to him and I give without expecting anything back. That sounds so religious. It sounds, for some of us, it actually sounds right. That's really how it should be. Except there's one problem with it. It's wrong. That's now, it's all God's. Like I said, it's all God's. It's all God's. God can ask for whatever he wants, anytime he wants to. And whether or not there's a promise of a harvest, whether or not God says he's going to bless us back, the tithe belongs to God. Not only does the tithe belong to God, but after the tithe, the rest of it came from God. He can ask for whatever he wants to. But wouldn't it be, think about the child whose mother says, if you clean your room, I'll give you a Reese cup. So he cleans his room and then says, nah, mom, you just keep the Reese cup. I don't, I don't want it. That's stupid. <laughs> he should have cleaned his room anyway. He should have cleaned, shouldn't he? Should have cleaned the room anyway. But if his mom's going to, I'm saying you should have cleaned your room anyway. But if mom's promising you the Reese cup, take it. Amen. It all belongs to God. If God asks for it, God can have it. But when God says, when you sow financially into my kingdom, I want to bless you. How dumb is it to say, no, God, you just, hey, I'll take yours. 
No, God, you just keep it. I mean, if you're going to give it anyway, why not expect a harvest so that you can be blessed to be a blessing in the future? Amen. You know, there are people who give and give and give and live poor. And, and actually, some people in the body of Christ are going, I'm not, I'm not going to sow into the kingdom because that guy sows into the kingdom. And he's dirt poor. He's dirt poor because he doesn't expect a return. He's dirt poor because he wants God to keep it. He's dirt poor because I got his. Because I believed for it. Because he didn't want it. When you sow, expect a harvest. Imagine a farmer who goes out to a field and sows a hundred acres of wheat. And then says, you know what, what I don't really want to return. I don't really, I don't really expect a harvest. It's okay, just leave it out there. Does anybody besides me think that's really dumb? Not all giving is sowing. Sometimes we give, sometimes we do things, and it's not good ground, and, and we don't expect a return. But when I sow, when I sow into this church, when I sow into the kingdom of God, I res- expect a return, not because I'm shaking my fist at God and saying, God, you have to give me something, but because God said if I would, he would bless me. Right. It's God's promise, it's not mine. Amen. I didn't say, God, I'll give it if you'll bless me. God said, if you'll give it, I'll bless you. Did that make sense? Let me say that again. I didn't say, God, I'll give it if you bless me. God said, if you'll give it, I'll bless you. When you sow, the soil matters. See, when you give, the soil doesn't matter. If you're just giving out of the goodness of your heart, or you're just giving because you want to help somebody, you're just, the soil doesn't matter. Because you're not going to get it back anyway. But when you're sowing, expecting a harvest, the soil matters. The soil matters. Matthew 13, 1 through 9, talks about the soil that we sow in. Some of the seed fell on good ground. Some of the seed fell on thorny ground, stony ground. Some of the seed fell on hard ground and the sun baked it. The soil matters. What kind of soil it is. So you want to be sure that where you're sowing is good ground, that it produces a harvest. Does it produce a harvest for other people? Can you see the fruit of the gospel? Can you see the fruit of the kingdom of God in the soil that you're sowing in? And by the way, I'm just going to walk out on the water right now and say this. Just take a deep breath. Where you sow is important. And some people are sowing in a different field than they expect a harvest in. Now, listen, not everything, this is on live stream, isn't it? Let's just say it anyway. Not everything on Christian television is good for you. Not everything on Christian television is good. There's some, now, there's some good stuff on there. Don't get me wrong. There's some really good stuff on there. And then there is some stuff that you should not listen to. And hopefully, I'm teaching you the word in a way that you know the difference. You can, even if you don't know exactly what it is, you can just turn it on after five minutes and go, I don't know what it is, but that's creepy. But not everything on Christian television is good for you, and you shouldn't watch it. Just because it's on such and such a channel does not mean it's good. But there is good stuff on there. And we should be blessing it. And we should be sowing into it. We should be encouraging them and blessing them. We should be doing that. But some people sow all their seed in those fields and not realizing that the harvest is happening there and the harvest is not happening right in their own field where they expect to reap. You know, I know know people that have, they'll sow their tithe, they'll sow their offering, they'll sow everything they got into a television ministry, and then they don't understand why their church can't do stuff. It's because your seed is coming up in another harvest field somewhere else. Mm, It's going to come up where you sow it. Okay. When you sow, the soil matters. And thirdly, when you sow, you expect a particular harvest. A farmer doesn't just throw out seed and hope something comes up. Well, Billy, I don't know what kind of seed this is in this bag, but let's just let's just sow it out here and see what comes up. But that's a lot of times the way Christians sow their seed. The Bible says that every seed produces after its own kind. That is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 12. And so you need to sow your seed with a particular harvest in mind. And this is true for anything. Uh, every seed produces after its own kind, Genesis 1, 12. 
112, yep. Which means that whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. Uh, for example, in uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, is exactly about sowing and reaping. Proverbs 18, 24 says that if you need friends, you need to show yourself friendly. It's exactly the law of sowing and reaping. You need friends. You have a hard time with friends. You don't have any friends. I can't find any friends. Here's an idea. Be friendly. Sow a seed of friendship. Well, that person doesn't like me. We'll do it again. Sow again. Keep sowing friendship until you reap friends. Don't put money in an offering. Write friends on it and then expect people to come to you and be your friend. Because every seed's going to produce that now. If you want the kind of friends that money can buy, then you can put a seed in, on there, get the money, and then buy friends with it. But you don't want the kind of friends that money buys. A carpool. I talked to a lady one time. I wish I could find somebody in my neighborhood to carpool with me. Everybody's going to school, but nobody will carpool with me. And I said, well, why don't you go around the, around the neighborhood and offer to take the kids to school yourself? Sow a seed. Sow. Sow. You want somebody to open doors of opportunity for you in business? Sow a seed of opportunity. Nobody will open any doors of opportunity. You open some doors of opportunity to people that need the doors that you can open. The Bible says that every seed produces after its own kind. But remember this, Ecclesiastes 10.9 says that money has answers. And so when you sow money, oftentimes people will sow money, and you should. It's fine. You need a car, you sow an offering, you write car on it. The chances are you're not going to get the car. The chances are you're going to get the money to buy the car. Because every seed produces after its own kind. I'm not saying it's impossible to, to reap a car. Actually, that happened to our daughter. Our daughter sowed money and reaped a car. So it can happen. But that's, that's kind of like a, never mind. That's like a wild seed getting into the, you know, you're sowing, you're sowing broccoli. And then where did that corn stalk come from? Well, it was the seed was in there. You, you think about that on your way home. So, you know, wh whatever it is that you need to receive from God, realize that money almost all the time is the answer to that. And that when we sow money, we reap the finances that we need to do that. So number three, not all giving is sowing. Number four, don't wait until you need a harvest to sow a seed. I see this happen so many times. People go, oh, I, I need this. I need this by Friday. And so they want to run here on Sunday and sow a seed, hoping that something miraculous happens between now and Friday. Not realizing that uh, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, it says, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest will not cease from the earth. In other words, there's seed time and there's harvest. And seed time and harvest are generally, as a rule, not a week apart. If a farmer waits till he wants the crop to sow the seed, he's going to be hungry from, for anywhere from 60 to, to 75 days. For that seed to, come, to germinate, to, for that seed to come up, for it to sprout, come up, make a stalk, make an ear, corn in the ear, corn ripens, you can eat it. Most corn, 60 to 75 days, I think. He's going to be hungry if he sows it the week he wants it. But I see Christians do that all the time. Instead of being sensitive and realizing that you can sow and God will bless you back on every wave. You can, sow, you can sow for your future. This is why you're sitting in a church service and you don't particularly need anything. You're not particularly looking for anything. You don't particularly have any needs. But the Holy Spirit speaks to you and he says, I want you to sow this. You've got to be kidding. No, I want you to sow this. Get behind me, Satan. I want you to sow this. <laughs> Because he sees down the road what's getting ready to come. It's a big thing, takes a big seed. But we don't have the vision to see what's coming. So we ignore that voice. Then we get there and we go, oh, I wish I could. I wish I had that. It's just right here. It's right within my grasp. Number five. 2 Corinthians 9, 10. When God wants to meet your need... He gives you seed. A lot of times we pray for our needs and we, we think God's just going to meet those. God, I need, I need a car. I need a reliable car. And we think we're going to walk out. We're going to get up. We're going to walk out in the morning. There's going to be a car in our driveway. No, God might bless you, probably will bless you with seed to sow. What does 2 Corinthians 9, 10 say? 
It says he supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. That he will multiply the seed you've sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. It says that God, when God supplies you, God not only supplies uh, our needs, bread for food, our needs, but he also supplies seed to sow. And it's up to us to determine what is what. And I see so many people who... Um, I see people who can't discern the difference and, and we think everything that we get belongs to us and we spend it all on ourselves. Not stopping and taking that moment to say, God, what of this is seed and what of this is for me to spend? Number five, that's number five. Number six, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly and he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Is everybody okay? It's awful quiet in here. Everybody all right? 2 Corinthians 9, 6. We will reap a harvest in direct proportion to the size of our seed, not the size of our heart. Everybody wants to live next door to a farmer who's got a big heart. But his crop is still determined by the seed he sows. So sometimes people use the excuse that, well, you know, I, I don't tithe and I don't sow, but God sees my heart. Well, God sees your heart, but the Bible says, the Bible does not say that heaven opens over you because you've got a big heart. It doesn't even say heaven opens over you because God's got a big heart. It says heaven opens over you because you tithe. Is this too tough? Everybody okay? The Bible does not say that what comes through that window when you tithe is determined by your big heart. You can have a big heart. Thank God for Christians who have big hearts. I love Christians who have big hearts. But your harvest is determined by what you sow. You actually sow. Thank you. Now I want to talk with you about how to sow your way to a large seed. Because some people, some people, have the ability to sow a large seed. Some people do not. Some people, your, your seed, when, you know, you, for you, a large seed is $5, and what you're really believing for is a big deal. And $5 is not going to get you there. What you do is you sow that, and then I was talking with a guy uh, on, uh, on the phone not too long ago who just sowed his first $100,000 seed. He was so excited. You could hear his voice quiver. He was not quivering because he was upset. He was, he was quivering because he was so excited. He's been dreaming of doing this for years. And this guy and his wife used to live in a rat-infested trailer. What happened? They sowed their way to that. They sowed their way to it by taking that $10 and sowing that $10. And then God blessed them with 20 and so then they took that 20 and they sowed 15 and kept five and God blessed them with 50 and then they sowed the 25 and kept the 25 and God blessed them with 100 and they sowed the 60 and kept the 40 and God blessed them with 200 and so then they sowed the 120 and kept the 80 and God blessed them with 500 then they sowed the 300 and kept the 200 and God blessed them with 1,000 is anybody going with me here? God blessed them with 1,000 so then they took the 800 and kept the 200 and God blessed them with 5,000 so they took the 3,000 kept the 2,000 and God blessed them with 10,000 That's how you do it. Oh, I wish I, you know, the, the dream God's given me is so big and I have so little. You got to start somewhere. And like 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 9, 10 says, he supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. And so many times people will get finances and not, pray, not at least pray and ask God, what is it? You get a $2,000 bonus, $2, bonus at work. You weren't expected. Oh, zowie. Headed to the beach. Just stop them. Just take a moment and stop and lay your hands on it. You and your spouse and just ask God, God, what of this is seed and what of this is for us? We've had God speak to us and say, it's all yours. You do whatever you want to with it. We've had God speak to us and say, it's all mine and I want you to sow it all here. Just ask. Just pray because God gives seed to the sower and bread for food. I hope this is helping somebody. That's how you sow your way to a large seed. Don't, <laughs> everybody smile at me. Keep that smile on for as long as you can. Don't pretend to sow your way to a large seed if you already have one. 
Like I said, we, you know, when you sow, we're not, we don't, I don't, I don't look at people's giving anyway. So I'm not looking and going, wow, how come he didn't give more? I don't, I don't know what people give and I don't know, I don't know who has the ability to give what, but the Holy Spirit knows. He's the one that's setting you up for your future. He knows, we'll tell you, we're, we're happy with anything. We're happy with the $5, the $500, the $5,000, the $50,000. We're happy with all of it. We appreciate every giver. But sometimes when people hear me talking about starting small, starting with $5, starting with $10 and giving their way up, then sometimes people go, you know what, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start today and I'm going to give this $10. And the Holy Spirit's saying, you know what you've got back there that you need to be sowing. Now I'm going to start with $10 and I'm going to sow my way. And he's saying, you've already got the seed that you need. Sometimes I've seen people try to pretend they don't have the seed that the Holy Spirit wants them to sow. Here again, don't, don't anybody give, I'm just the messenger. I'm just, I don't, I don't have any idea what anybody's situation is. But what I'm saying is that oftentimes people will pretend. You don't have to pretend to us because we're not after your money. You don't have to pretend to me. You don't have to pretend to anybody in this church about what you give, what you don't give. It's, it's all God's. And people need to give according to what they purpose in their heart. What's a large seed to one is a small seed to another. It depends on the harvest you're expecting. So uh, what's a small seed to one person can be a really, really large seed to somebody else. Number seven, whatever seed we hold on to and do not sow, that seed will not multiply. While it is in your possession, it is the most it will ever be. So whatever seed you have... As long as it stays there, I can have a whole wheelbarrow full of seed here. But as long as it stays in the wheelbarrow, it's just seed. That's a lot of seed, but it's not producing anything because it's still in the wheelbarrow. In order for the seed to produce a harvest, you have to what? You have to what? You have to what? Everybody say you have to sow it. You have to sow it if you want to reap a harvest. While it's in your possession, it's the most it will ever be. And then number eight, whatever good thing you cause to happen in the house of God, God will cause it to happen in your house. Ephesians 6, 8. What is happening in the house of God? What's happening in the church that you go to? What is God? Is there abundance in the house? If there's abundance in this house, there'll be abundance in, the, in your house. If, this, if the needs of this house are, are met, the needs of your house will be met. If, if abundance is overflowing in this house, abundance will be overflowing in your house. Whatever you cause to happen for the house of God, God will cause it to happen for your house. So that's why I don't, I don't, from time to time we have done it, but I really don't like going to the congregation. I've been to churches where every two weeks it was, we need this and we need that. And we, you know, we need, now we need to buy one of these. How many people will help us buy one of those? We need to do that. And from time to time, if there are needs, people in the congregation have asked me, my goodness, if you need this, just tell us. We'd like to sow toward it. So we do that from time to time. But I really would like to get the congregation. I've seen congregations so dependent on that that they don't ever sow into the house of God until a need is presented. That's when they do it. I want to get us past the need mentality to the abundance mentality where people aren't just sitting there going, well, whenever the church needs something, I guess they'll tell us, no, I want to get us to the mentality that we're sure the church has abundance and whatever they need, they'll take care of it. Right. Hello. Amen. I believe in a church of abundance, not a church of now we need a roof on this and now we need carpet for this and now we need to do this and now we need to do that. Amen. Mm, whatever good thing you cause to happen in the house of God, God will cause to happen in your house. What is it you need to happen in your house? What is it that you need for God to do? What is it, how is it that you need God to bless you? What's your vision? What's in your future? What is it that you want to see God manifest in your future? And what have you sown toward it? I'm not asking you now if you're a tither. I'm asking you what have you sown toward your future? And you may not even know what your future is. That's why we have to, I have to do this all the time. I have to keep my ear to the Holy Spirit because a lot of times I don't know what opportunities are coming, what situations are coming down the pike. And so I have to keep my ear to the Spirit when he says, do this, sow this, give this, do this. I used to ask why. I stopped asking that <laughs> after several times of not getting a why. It's just, you know, your future, you can't process the future. You just be obedient in the seed. The future will open itself up. 
So right now, right now, we tithed. There's a reason why I did that. And that's because I wanted you to understand the difference between the tithe and the offering and how they work. We already received the tithe. Heaven is open over this congregation. Hello? And so now we're going to receive an offering. And I got four questions I want to ask you about this offering. Number one, and I want everybody to look at me. Don't everybody, don't anybody get an envelope. I want everybody to look at me. I want to ask you four questions. Number one, what will I sow today that will determine what comes to me from an open heaven? Number two, what measure will I use today that is the same measure God will use? Number three, what am I going to cause to happen in the house of God today that God then is going to cause to happen in my house? And number four, what am I going to name my seed? So I want to ask everyone to get an envelope. I don't want you to write anything on it yet. I want everybody just to get an envelope. I want you to hold it in your hands and I just want us to pray. Can you bring me an envelope, Katie? Thank you. I want us to pray over this offering right now. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to sow in the house of God. We know that Galatians says that we're, uh, we're not to be deceived that you will not be mocked at whatever we sow, that's what we're going to reap. So today, we commit ourselves to sow toward our future. Holy Spirit, we're listening to you. We're attentive to your voice. And if you show us what to give, we commit ourselves to be obedient to you. If we don't particularly hear anything, we still know what our future is. And we have a desire in our heart to sow toward that future. And, and Colossians says that you work in the desires of our heart. So today, we're committing ourselves to sow a seed toward our future. A seed that will determine what comes out of that open heaven. A seed that will determine the measure that you use to give back to me again. That what I cause to happen in the house of God today is what you're going to cause to happen in my house. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen.